This is KJ here going over part 2 of 4.01 acid and base properties and we ended with Arrhenius or Arrhenius, I've heard it pronounced both ways, and what he said made an acid and a base. So now we're going to go ahead to what Bronsted and Lowry said. Bronsted and Lowry were two separate scientists but we combine it and say since they came up with the same idea at the same time in two different countries they both get credit so Bronsted Lowry. And Bronsted Lowry both said an acid is a proton, which is an H plus, is removed. Therefore, we call it a proton donor. Okay, well that's kind of the same thing up here, right? It's like, okay, that H comes off. And if you're going to donate a proton, that means you had to have started with one. And remember, a proton is also called an hydrogen ion, is also H plus. These are the same. Make sure you know those. Base a proton H plus is gained or a proton acceptor. So in this case the H plus came off and it had to go somewhere so it goes on to the base. Now this you don't have to write down but just kind of an FYI. The truth is slightly different than donor and acceptor might imply. In an acid the hydrogen ion is bonded to the rest of the molecule. It takes energy sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, to break that bond. So the acid molecule does not give or donate the proton, it has to be taken away. In the same sense, you do not donate your wallet to the pickpocket. You have to have it removed from you. The base is a molecule with a built-in drive to collect protons. As soon as the base approaches the acid, it will, if strong enough, rip the proton off the acid molecule and add it to itself. Ha ha ha! So you can also think of the big, blue, bitter bases as the bad guy, right? It's stealing those protons. Now, this is where all the fun stuff comes in that you get to learn. You see, some bases are stronger than others, meaning some have a large desire for protons, while other bases have a weaker drive. It's the same way with acids. Some have very weak bonds, and the proton is easy to pick off, while other acids have stronger bonds, making it harder to get the proton. But again, every textbook says it's a proton donor and proton acceptor. Lewis. Okay, yeah, this is the same guy who figured out the Lewis dot diagrams that we did in first semester, where elements in group one have one valence electron, elements in group two have two valence electrons, etc. So Lewis said, we are inclined to think of substances as possessing acid or base properties without having a particular solvent in mind. It seems to me that with complete generality, we may say that a basic substance is one which has a lone pair of electrons which may be used to complete the stable group of another atom, and that an acid is one which can employ a lone pair from another molecule in completing the stable group of one of its own atoms. By the way, the italicized words are Lewis's. He finished the above paragraph with one more sentence, a restatement of what he just said. In other words, the basic substance, so the base, furnishes a pair of electrons for the chemical bond. The acid substance accepts each pair. So in other words, Lewis was basically saying, well, we don't always have it dissolved in stuff, and we don't always have a hydrogen ion. So yeah, we don't need the hydrogen in order to truly have an acid, and we don't need to have it dissolved. So here's what you should write down for Lewis. The modern way to define a Lewis acid and base is a bit more concise. So the acid is an electron acceptor. A base is an electron donor. A Lewis acid is any atom, ion, or molecule which can accept electrons. And a Lewis base is any atom, ion, or molecule capable of donating electrons. However, a warning. Many textbooks will say electron pair, where I have only written electron. The truth is that sometimes it's an electron pair, and sometimes it's just one electron. You don't have to worry about that. I'm not going to try and trick you on that. This is the main idea for Lewis. It turns out that it may be more accurate to say that Lewis acids are substances which are electron deficient. Or in other words, they don't have enough. Lewis bases are substances that are electron rich, or in a way they kind of have too many. Several categories of substances can be considered Lewis acids. Positive ions, having less than a full octet in the valence shell. Polar double bonds, one end, and expandable valence shells. You do not need to write this down. This is the only thing you need to write down from Lewis. Several categories of substances can be considered Lewis bases. Negative ions, one or more unshared pairs of valence shell, polar double bonds, the other end, and the presence of a double bond.
All right, so again, make sure you have this in your notes and hit pause, take a second to maybe cover it up with your hand and see if you can fill in what should be in each of these boxes on the table. All right, conducting electricity. So again, I'd make another line going horizontally in your notes because now we're talking about conducting electricity. They both do. This is a common property shared with salts. Acids, bases, and salts are grouped together into a category called electrolytes. Ooh, you've heard of that, especially with like Gatorade and Powerade, right? Filled with electrolytes. That means that a water solution of the given substance will conduct an electric current. For example, table salt in water would be an electrolyte. Non-electrolyte solutions cannot conduct a current such as sugar. So NaCl, you have a metal and a non-metal in an ionic compound. Sugar, you have only nonmetals in covalent bonds, so that's why the difference. What does it cancel out? Okay, draw another line. In other words, if I put acids into a solution, what is it going to cancel? Acids neutralize or cancel out bases. Bases neutralize or cancel out acids. So an acid plus a base yields water plus a salt. Okay, salt is any ionic compound, such as NaCl, like the table salt you eat, but it can be other salts too. It can be KBr, KCl, etc. In other words, it's the leftovers. Neutralization reaction, make sure you write this down, a reaction between an acid and a base that produces water and, I like to put the a uh in there, a uh salt, to remind us that it does not have to be table salt, even though in my example up here, I gave you table salt. So I have the H, and the OH come together. So I have H2O, that makes water, and I have my Na come together with my Cl to make a salt. Now, if I wanted to, I could change this and say, all right, let's use totally different elements. Now, what would this final compound be? Well, the H and the OH went into water, so I have KBr left over. Why does the K have to be first? because it's positive, it's the positive ion. We always write the positive ion first. Hopefully you remember some of those little things that I'm saying from first semester. So again, we have our base, so it separates out, our acid it separates out, it makes water, and NaCl. Salt is a salt, but not all salts are salt. So, in other words, what I just said, we think of table salt as salt, and it is but there are other salts in chemistry. It's just the leftover ionic compound. All right, you do not have to write down the slide. Salts can be many different types of ionic compounds. The salts that form from neutralization reactions are typically ionic crystalline solids. They have high melting points and usually dissolve in water. Salts are good conductors of electricity. For example, if the acid HCl is mixed with the base NaOH, which may result in an explosive reaction, a salt is formed. This is common table salt. H2SO4 mixed with potassium hydroxide brings about this reaction. H2SO4 plus two molecules of potassium hydroxide yields K2SO4 plus two water molecules. So this is water and we would call this what? We would call it a salt. The salt potassium sulfate, a common ingredient in fertilizers, is produced. Salts exhibit interesting properties of their own and are used for many food-related applications. So table salt, potassium sulfate is fertilizer, magnesium sulfate is a drying agent used to absorb excess water, and potassium by tartrate is a stabilizer for egg whites, prevents sugar syrups from crystallizing, reduces discoloration of boiled vegetables. How does it react with other things? Okay, draw another line. So acid, upon chemically reacting with an acid metal, sorry, let me say that again. Upon chemically reacting with an active metal, acids will make hydrogen gas. Okay, so this sentence add to your notes. Examples of active metals are alkali and alkaline earth metals. So which groups on the periodic table? Groups one and two, way on the left. Some metals like gold, silver, or platinum are rather unreactive and it takes rather extreme conditions to get those unreactive metals to react. So here it shows we have a metal plus an acid. Our clue that this is an acid is it starts with an H. It makes a salt and in this case it makes hydrogen 
bubbles. Bases feel slippery or soapy. This is because they dissolve the fatty acids and oils from your skin and this cuts down on the friction between your fingers as you rub them together. In essence, the base is making soap out of you. Yeah, kind of creepy. Yes, bases are involved in the production of soap. In the early years of soap making, the soaps were very harsh on the skin and clothes due to the high base content. Even today, people with sensitive skin and babies must sometimes use a non-soap based product for bathing because otherwise it literally eats the skin. Okay, new line. Changes the color of litmus indicator paper. Acids turn red. B -b bases are blue. And we're going to talk about litmus indicator paper. And so for now, just write it down because it's going to be coming up in another section. How do we measure the strength of acids and bases? Acids, the pH equals 0 to 6.999999999999, or in other words, less than 7. I always remember that this way is less because it kind of looks like the letter L, right? It's going the same direction as your L. So that's a good way to remember that that is less than. Bases, therefore, are greater than 7. So they go all the way up to 14. And I put 7.01, but really, I could throw all kinds of zeros in there. If it's anything mo more than exactly 7, it's a base. So bases are big and blue. Neutral. Neither acid or base has a pH of 7. We will talk about what pH is in the next few lessons. And so here's some examples. Battery acid is almost as acidic as you can get. The acid in your stomach. Lemon juice is around a 2. Cola is about a 2.5. Vinegar is about a 3. So these are less acidic than over here. So the rainbow is helpful because we go from red to a little bit weaker, weaker, weaker. And then, oh, yep, right in the middle is pure water and then it starts to turn into more of a base. So for example, really strong bases are bleach, household lye, ammonia, hand soaps between a 9 and a 10, seawater is an 8, blood is a little bit more than 7, healthy human saliva is a little bit acidic, which helps kill some of the germs, which is good, milk is a little bit acidic, tea or healthy skin, a little bit more acidic, Acid rain can pretty much be anywhere less than five. Coffee is five. Beer is four and a half. Yes, of course, you need to be over 21 to consume that. Although I did choose this chart because I like that it had a lot of common stuff on here. So oranges or apple juice, and then of course the ones that I went over. So this is our scale for if something is a very, very strong acid. An acid, but kind of weak because it's almost neutral. Seven is neutral. Eh, kind of a weak base because it's still pretty close to being neutral all the way to a super strong base. Alright, that is it for this lesson. Go ahead and do the pre-quiz.